So to begin with, Max Park, whose last talk for the Friends of Arlington's David M. Brown Planetarium was in 2019, is going to present a brief overview of NASA's evolving role in the US federal government, and then provide insight on the political factors that guide NASA's efforts. He's a lifelong student of space and science with degrees in physics, astronomy, and space policy. He's currently working on his PhD in geophysics and space physics at UCLA. Max has worked at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, studying Mars, as well as the atmospheres of bodies in the outer solar system. Thank you, Max. Thank you so much. So uh, first off, hi, I'm Max, and uh, I am, uh, as, as mentioned, I've, I've done a fair bit of um, studying in an academic sense, uh, both in science, but also in science policy. Um, but uh, I, I have also uh, had a bit of working experience both at NASA Goddard, as was mentioned, that was doing uh, research. Um, I also actually have uh, been working part-time uh, in addition to my research uh, with NASA headquarters. Uh, originally, I was in the Office of Legislative Affairs, and we'll get to that. Um, and uh, more recently, I've been working in the Mars Exploration Group, uh, helping set human goals or goals for human exploration of Mars. So uh, that is a little bit about who I am and my background. Um, a couple things I would like to get out of the way just to, to sort of set the scene. Um, I, I wanna sort of make three promises. Uh, first, I wanna tell you what we're, what we're all going to learn about. Um, and that is, uh, we're gonna be talking about the, um, we're gonna be talking about the executive branch and the legislative branch. Uh, uh, these, these are the two branches that generally guide NASA's, um, generally guide NASA's direction. Um, and as we'll learn, it, it, executive branch is much more like, you know, we tell you where to go and what to do. And um, the, whereas the legislative branch, uh, since they control the purse strings, they're usually the ones who say, we tell you what you can afford. Um, and that's <clears throat> money talks. And, and that's sort of what ends up, uh, you know, that, that dynamic is really what ends up driving NASA's goals. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to tell you. The second thing I wanted to uh, um, let you guys know is that I, I much prefer a conversation to lecture. Um, and so there will be a small break in the middle, uh, as well as I'll try and leave lots of room for questions at the end. Questions are my favorite part. Um, and I'll also uh, ask your forgiveness uh, preemptively if any, if I go off on any uh, tangents. I love space and I love talking about space and there's a lot of cool stuff to talk about. So um, I'll try and keep it focused. Um, and the third thing is that this is not a technical talk. Uh, there is but one equation. Um, and this one equation I will, I will warn you about uh, so no one need fear it, um, I, but I think you'll be able to handle it. So um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Um, Oh, I guess the last thing is I love pretty pictures. So there's a lot of pretty pictures in here. We're, we're at the planetarium group. So I, everyone loves looking at space here. Um, so to start with that, here we go. Um, wow, what a great planet, excellent. Um, so uh, part one, we're gonna be talking about the executive branch. So uh, to guiding questions we wanna think about while we're, while we're going through this, um, and this was sort of part of my undergraduate research as well, um, was talking about like, why haven't we gone back to the moon yet? And uh, you know, why did we sort of leave that behind? Why did we step back from that? Um, and what is, what is driving NASA from an executive perspective? Um, and also, you know, do, do citizens really understand what drives NASA and, and how can we um, do better uh, to, to guide it ourselves as, as citizens? It is our space program after all. Um, so a little bit of history. Uh, NASA grew out of uh, a group called NACA, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. Um, and uh, essentially that was a, um, th that was a early 20th century group uh, set up by the government to help develop uh, technologies for flight. Uh, Orville Wright, I believe, uh, had played a meaningful role in its uh, founding and, and early years as well. And it was sort of, you know, when, when planes are new and people are doing research, uh, they have to keep that research somewhere. And so NACA was one of the groups that did that. 
And NASA continued on that development, uh, taking over a number of NACA facilities um, and, and sort of continuing its, its research focus. Um, but that research was always sort of paired well with, uh, paired closely with both civilian and military operations. Um, and so, you know, when, when NACA was developing planes, part of those planes were for, for war. And, um, and that continued on as NASA started to develop space technologies. Uh, the, um, it also meant that there was a, a more objective-based focus where, where you wanted to, you know, if you're in the military, you're, you're told to go take that hill and invade that country. Um, and, and you just sort of do it. You, you're not sort of balancing the budget or, you know, what can we fit into this year's fiscal uh, appropriations? Um, however, all of that changed with Nixon. Um, Nixon, uh, the Nixon administration was essentially, um, they, they, they had the, both the, the honor of, of overseeing the successful Apollo program, um, but also the financial burden of that Apollo program. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the, the funding curves for NASA, but there's just, you know, NASA was taking, I think, 5% um, of, the, uh, of the national budget at its peak. Um, and so that was, that was a big expenditure. And uh, Nixon was a little wary of that and, and wanted to rein it in, uh, wanted it to stop being such a, such a military organization where it's, you know, go take that hill and Congress will pay you whatever you need to do it. Um, and instead wanted to shift it more into a, a just another department, just another agency, um, just another tool in the executive tool belt. Um, and when he was doing that, he thought to, you know, he, his priority had, uh, the, the Nixon administration's priority had been, among other things, one, curbing excess spending, but two, prioritizing infrastructure in the U.S. Um, and uh, essentially, there, there came a moment where um, Nixon was presented with, with four, you know, sort of four fated envelopes, each one with a different plan for what to do with NASA from, you know, go build a huge Mars base right now or cancel NASA forever, it's too expensive. And uh, the option that Nixon ended up choosing um, was uh, sort of tailored to his administration's interests. That is, uh, NASA proposed building a giant reusable space truck um, that is that would basically serve as space infrastructure such that you could develop um, outer space and U.S. assets in outer space um, with this reusable space truck. And hopefully that would drive down costs and, and make it very, very readily accessible. Now, you guys might be familiar with that giant reusable space truck. Dang, what a sweet reusable space truck. Um, so uh, it, uh, it, it was, you know, that, that was the, the Nixon administration's plan. And, uh, and it ostensibly worked. Um, however, after Nixon, um, admin, presidential administration started to realize that they didn't need to, you know, carry on the the work of of administrations past. That they could instead sort of shift NASA to focus on whatever they thought was more important. Um, and so, uh, one of the the first administrations to do this after Nixon was the Reagan administration. Um, the Reagan administration obviously focused on uh, sort of winning the Cold War. Uh, wanted to push for international cooperation, but also sort of build a, a in club, a um, you know, sort of if you cooperate, if you play nice with the US in the world, um, you get to become a, a, a sort of secondary partner on our cool space station. Um, that cool space station being called uh, Space Station Freedom uh, because there was no such thing as being too on the nose uh, for, for the, the point they were trying to make. But um, following uh, Reagan, uh, HW, uh, President George H.W. Bush, uh, his administration had to deal with the result of winning the Cold War, that is the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and so, uh, well, I, well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but first, uh, when H.W. Bush came into uh, office, one of the things that he proposed um, was the Space Exploration Initiative. Um, and that was essentially a return to a sort of Apollo-style big exploration 
um, humans going to the moon and going to Mars and, and using this awesome orbital station as maybe like a place to assemble um, spacecraft on orbit. And, uh, and really this administration was trying to put crewed spaceflight as a priority. Um, it didn't end up happening uh, for reasons we will talk about later. Um, and uh, the Clinton administration came in. And the Clinton administration was the administration uh, that had to deal with the sort of uh, fallout, if you will, of the um, collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and so the, the Clinton administration wasn't really focused on space. They, they were more focused on the, the worldly uh, concerns. But as we've been talking about, um, any good president worth their salt uses the tools at their disposal. And so Clinton realized that by spinning this space station freedom project, not as a in club, but as a, you know, doors open, everyone come on, you know, everyone come on board, um, Clinton could actually could use NASA to um, continue the, the work that he was doing in global security, which was to prevent former Soviet nuclear scientists and rocket scientists from going to rogue states, um, the Iran's and North Korea's of the world that uh, might not, um, that, that perhaps America didn't want having access to a lot of former Soviet rocket scientists. And so instead, uh, essentially what we did was we gave the Soviet space program a, a good boost um, to, to try and you know, to, to continue doing what it was doing. Um, and so the result of that was opening up space station freedom to become the international space station we know and love today. Um, and uh, you know the, the predecessor to that, the, or rather the precursors to that, were the missions, the shuttle missions to the Mir space station. You know, if it, you have an American reusable space truck going and visiting this former Soviet, now Russian um, laboratory in space, and that was a that was a, a big success, um, both in terms of administration priorities and in terms of cool things that NASA has done. Um, Next up, we have George H. W. Bush, or George W. Bush, um, and George W. Bush, uh, in in what seems to be a theme of his presidency, decided to carry on his father's work, and uh, the um, and and reinvigorated the Constellation program. Uh, the Constellation program was, uh, or rather, reinvigorated uh, crewed spaceflight through the Constellation program. Um, essentially, a proposal for a number of um, human exploration vehicles uh, to start pushing out to the moon, as you can see, uh, I don't know if I have a, a laser pointer, um, but as, as you, you know, the, the moon and uh, Mars in the background. Um, and so uh, the, um, yeah, and so, so once again, space became a high priority um, or crude space flight became a high priority, which was, um, and I, I'm sure you're starting to notice a pattern here. Um, there's a little bit of, you know, first one way, then the other, um, and that is the ebb and flow of the um, ed, uh, executive branch. Uh, and we see that uh, represented in Obama's administration as well. Um, Obama's administration was the first administration that I personally worked in. Um, I was there in 2015, um, for the, that was when I was at the NASA Legislative Affairs Office. Um, so uh, Obama's uh, priority shifted from away from that crude exploration uh, towards um, science, particularly earth science. Uh, one of Obama's big pushes was to help us fight climate change. And so um, this uh, picture here is a big, uh, is sort of uh, sometimes called the swoosh chart. Um, and the swoosh chart uh, is uh, all of the NASA assets that we built and um, were operating to study the earth and its climate. Um, again, you know, using, using NASA to uh, push it, uh, a presidential administration, that's, that's what they do. Um, the other thing that was interesting about the Obama administration, and this was less of a, uh, of a, um, less of a administrative priority and more of sort of NASA figuring out how to continue to operate um, is uh, we started to push towards the commercialization of human spaceflight. Um, Obama, the Obama administration uh, laid the groundwork for the commercial crew and commercial cargo programs that uh, now supply the ISS and um, are, are the 
you know, the, the famous uh, SpaceX uh, Falcon uh, or Dragon uh, missions that have been going on uh, in this year have been the result of, of that. And so most recently we had the Trump administration. Uh, Trump uh, again sort of shifted away from uh, Mars. Um, so uh, sorry, uh, one last thing I'll say about the Obama administration was that that was also the start of what's called the Journey to Mars program, which was uh, the Obama administration sort of taking the work that had been done in the Constellation program and shifting it uh, in a more Mars centric direction. And so Trump, um, in an effort to sort of, I, I suppose, rebuke um, the past uh, administration, but also in an effort to focus on, on more tangible and achievable goals, um, wanted to put uh, moon exploration uh, forward. Um, anecdotally, uh, I, have, I have heard that that was a result of merely only feasibility. Trump is not a, a moon fan over a Mars fan. Um, but uh, from, from what I, I have heard, um, during the transition uh, at the start of the Trump administration, he pulled a bunch of NASA folks together and said, okay, blank check, how much money do you need to get to Mars in, by the end of my first term? Um, and uh, everyone, all of the scientists were a little taken aback at that uh, because you know, that's, a, that's a blatantly political objective. And, um, and also that's not really how orbits work. You know, you know, one launch you know, in the next two and a half years is, is, is gonna be tough to pull off a Mars mission. Um, but uh, so with, with that in mind, uh, the Trump administration shifted focus to the moon um, with the hope that uh, we could be landing humans back on the moon by the end of Trump's second term. Um, however, it also continued the uh, commercialization of space, um, particularly in low Earth orbit, where we now have uh, um, commercial, not only commercial launch providers uh, that NASA has funded, but also a bunch of smaller uh, operations. Electron rockets and, and astrolabs uh, and that sort of thing, um, and so uh, this leaves us to, to present day uh, with the Biden administration. Um, we're we're just kind of not sure right now. Uh, obviously, there's a lot been going on in the world uh, with pandemics and civil unrest. So uh, we're we're not you know space is not a high priority right now. Um, and uh, so it, it's probable that there will be a, a continuation of some previous work. Uh, my guess is that we'll see some of the Artemis heritage continuing, um, but it might get shifted back towards Mars. Um, we will likely see a, a resurgence of Earth science. Um, and, uh, you know, stay tuned for that. We, we, we will see who, uh, you know, who ends up being appointed the administrator, and that will tell us a lot about what's coming down the pipe. So. Um, to sort of recap this, uh, you know, as we're, as we're sort of wrapping up this, this first section, um, part one, um, the executive branch uh, is less beholden to public opinion. They've got, their, they've got their agendas that they're setting out to do, and they're just going to do it. Um, and, uh, but also, you've noticed that priorities can be, can be very changeable, uh, shift like the wind. Um, and it's also important to note that the executive branch is the one, because NASA is an administration within the executive branch, uh, the executive branch is the, is the one that says, you go here, do this. Um, and so if the executive branch wants Earth satellites, you build Earth satellites. Um, sort of looking ahead uh, to what we're gonna talk about next, um, we're gonna talk about Congress and how they're more beholden to the public um, and how their values are more consistent over time. Um, and essentially how NASA, we're gonna talk about one, we're gonna talk about one of the tools that NASA uses to um, bring the messaging of the executive branch, bring the to the halls of Congress and essentially uh, campaign for uh, what we'd like to do so that we get the money to do it. Um, to answer some of the questions we opened up with, uh, why haven't we gone back to the moon? Well, you know, we're no longer a military organization that is meant to, you know, plant a flag on that rock. Um, and we don't get the budget to just go plant a flag on that rock, however much it costs. Um, instead, NASA has become a, a, just another tool in the executive tool belt. Um, and as such, we, we, are, we are constrained um, as, as a, we are constrained by, by that. Um, but it also means that there's a stability there. You know, we're, we're departments of, of the government rarely get shut down and zeroed out. So uh, there's a stability that is afforded by being just another you know, executive branch uh, tool. 
Um, now, if you want to change this, if you really want to want to change the way that um, uh, you know, if you, if you want to go do something, go plant a flag on a rock or go study a particular place, um, that requires executive leadership. That requires a, a president who really wants to get something done. Um, Trump, uh, the, the Trump administration was actually an example of something like that, um, where the administration really wanted to get something done. Of course, that was partially due to Trump's enthusiasm for branding and uh, what would look good. Um, and, uh, and so that was one of the reasons why um, space exploration got sort of pushed to a, uh, to a top note. Um, however, it also requires uh, congressional savvy and, and the sort of stability, uh, you know, sustainability to, to propose a mission and not have that mission get canceled. Um, the, the moon missions, uh, the Apollo program spanned three presidential administrations. It's important to remember. So that is, uh, that is not something that is um, easy to pull off if you're, if, you're, if you're subject to the changing winds of politics. So next for NASA, we are, uh, we're, you know, the, the goal is to, to sort of keep doing what we're doing um, and uh, we, we will see what comes uh, down the pipe. Um, I really love that picture of the Hubble Space Telescope. I think it's really cool. That's the size of a school bus and it's just hanging in space, neat. Um, oh, and one more excellent picture because I think it's excellent. Uh, and this is actually the, the end of sort of part one. Um, and I actually kind of wanted to open it up uh, if there were any questions about part one. I know that that's, that was a lot and I, um, you know, a 45 minute talk is a, is a long talk. So I, I didn't want to um, go straight through. Um, does anyone have any questions about sort of the executive branch or, or um, anything that I, I, I might've uh, sped through, glossed over? Feel free to speak up um, if you're able to unmute. Uh, hi, uh, I heard uh, one of the astronauts uh, speak once, I can't remember which one, who, who talked about the shifting moon Mars priorities as, you know, all he could figure is that the moon is a red state. Um, and I didn't know, if, does it seem to be just sort of, you know, just sort of random, we want to do something different or is there some underlying thing in the difference of uh, Republican and Democratic administrations that seems to drive that uh, that shift? Um, so that is a that is a great question. Um, I would say it is not uh, it is it is not specifically a I suppose a red state um, as, as uh, our, our astronaut friend has has described it. Though I mean it's it's a fair characterization of the history. Um, Truth be told, uh, I mean, the, the space exploration initiative and the subsequent vision, vision for space exploration, uh, the two Bush programs were both um, sort of long-term goals. Uh, the um, vision for space exploration was the, uh, was, was the George W. Bush uh, um, program. And that, uh, that was more moon focused, but the space exploration initiative of H.W. Bush's uh, administration was a, a full program. It, it was not meant to just be, it was not a, a moon goal. Um, it was a moon to Mars goal. Um, and uh, the Mars part was actually really important and they included that in their budget. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, because they included that in their budget and because they were asked, they, they came up with a budget, um, essentially the space exploration initiative, um, the, the price tag on it when they pitched it to Congress in the mid nineties was about uh, 200 to I think 500 billion dollars somewhere in there and um, members of Congress thought that was horrifying um, and uh, you know I, reading up and doing research on this I, I sort of felt bad for uh, Dan Quayle um, H.W. Bush's vice president because you know, he was the one who had to go to present this program to Congress it, it is a, um, an interesting fact that and you see this with Mike Pence uh, and and uh, as well uh, in this most recent administration. Um, vice presidents traditionally are the ones that oversee the space programs. Uh, you know, uh, all the way back to, to Johnson overseeing Kennedy's space program. Um, for whatever reason, it's, it's just like, it's not quite big enough to be uh, uh, the, the top person, a, a top dog priority. Um, and so the vice president almost always ends up sort of shepherding um, NASA 
Um, however, uh, the uh, yeah, so Dan Quill basically had to go to Congress and ask for a whole bunch of money uh, for this Mars program, um, and uh, was was sort of laughed out of Congress and said, you know, there's no way that we'd spend 300 to 500 billion dollars over the next 30 years on this on this on this project. Um, and the unfortunate thing is that we we did then go ahead and spend kind of all that money on similar projects, um, but without the long term goals of, of, you know, and, and, and consistency, you know, that we've been talking about, uh, it, it didn't end up actually, um, you know, it obviously didn't end up happening. Um, and so instead, we, we sort of spent 10 to 15 billion dollars a year on space shuttles and uh and and the international space station which has been awesome let's let's not say it's not but uh you know i i i for one would love a mars base so um yeah it is it is not a to answer your question um it, it is not specific to to one administration or the other it is really just like most people want to reject what the last person did and so since bush decided that it was that, that Moon was going to be his thing. Uh, Bush Jr. was going to Moon was going to be his thing. Uh, Obama said it's Mars, and Trump said it's Moon, and now Biden's going to say probably it's Mars. Um, uh, that would be my guess. I have I have two questions. One is okay. uh, given your uh, mention that the uh, vice president seems to carry the ball on this. Is there any indication of uh, Kamala Harris's orientation toward? what she might want from NASA? And that's my, a great question. Uh, the answer is we have no idea. I thought I'd ask. Uh, the second question is, uh, should the Biden administration reorient toward science or uh, science in a sense, rather than crude spaceflight, what might be in jeopardy? So that's a um, that's a great question. Uh, the main thing that would be in jeopardy is the um, is the sort of human exploration development that's been going on so far. I mean, we've been we've been putting a fair chunk of money into um, human exploration systems, both in terms of funding the commercial crewed program, um, getting SpaceX up and running, um, but also uh, it, it developing like human class landers and that sort of thing for both the Moon and Mars. Uh, those are expensive projects that take a, a long-term commitment. Um, and so if you aren't committed to, to, to putting humans in a particular place at a particular time, um, you're not gonna be doing the groundwork that comes that has to come years and decades uh, before then. Um, and so it's, it's not so much that anything's never going to happen, um, but for every administration that pulls resources away from their predecessors' human exploration goals, um, we do unfortunately sort of see a, a um, we see the, the timelines step to the right, as we, as we say in the bureaucracy, um, as, as um, things shift into the future. Max, one quick question for you here. Um, for sure. So, uh, and then we'll go on to part two. So go ahead. Sure. Um, so uh, considering the, um, the, the rising role of, uh, of medium and heavy lift launch vehicles um, in the United States that are available for launch of, of government class payloads. Um, I guess the question is, where does SLS fit into all of that? Uh, speaking of large programs that have you know, taken many, many years and um, have you know, a, a, a fair amount of overrun. Um, do, so and, and I guess question. the, the, the mm -hmm. follow up to that is, is there a role for SLS um, in this current, uh, this current era of space, uh, space flight? So I think that is a, is a great question. Um, and uh, I think it actually definitely, um, it, it sort of leads me nicely into um, section two, which is the consistency of Congress. SLS, I don't know if you guys have heard, but SLS stands for the Space Launch System. Um, it is the continuation of Bush's Constellation rocket program. Um, and it has continued for now four administrations. Um, in part because it's also known as SLS as the Senate launch system. That is to say the legislative branch really likes it. And there are a few members in the legislative branch who, as mentioned, uh, that consistency, it's, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to get rid of it. Um, 
uh, especially, well, well, we'll talk about it and I, I will be sure to, to frame um, the, uh, the, the stuff uh, ahead as, as in, in terms of SLS. Um, but uh, largely speaking, um, it is a, uh, I, I do think that there's a role for it in so much as there's a role for, there, there's sort of a role for everything. Um, and until, until something literally bigger and better comes along, you know, they're, they're probably going to continue to develop it. Um, and, you know, if it's there, if people have built it, we'll, we'll use it. We'll put things on it and launch them to Mars. But uh, it, is, it is really just a question of um, what comes next. Um, so with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and jump into part two, uh, the legislative branch. Um, and uh, we'll, we've got a change in theme for a change in, uh, in, 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 in setting, if you will. We're now down in the halls of Congress. So um, many of you might have ideas of what politicians and Congress are like. Um, and uh, given that we are all I mean, some of this has been uncomfortably close to the truth on the right, um, but uh, this is more of an executive branch thing. Um, the, uh, the truth is that Congress, um, for any, any amount that they look, that members of Congress look like these pictures here, it's because they're really thinking like this. It is, it is that Congress, every member of Congress is thinking about getting reelected. Um, and you might think that this is incredibly selfish, uh, but, uh, and, and I'm sure some of them are very self-serving people who just want the status of being a member of Congress, but there are many people out there in the world who truly think, and you might be one of them in fact, who truly think that they know if only they had the power, they'd know how to fix this country. And if you know how to fix this country, then your best interest and the best interests of the country is obviously for you to be in power. And for you to be in power, you have to get reelected. And for you to be reelected, you have to sometimes uh, it takes some money from the Lockheed Martin aerospace corporations. Um, and sometimes you have to uh, um, really, really make it look like you're shouting down the other guy because that's, that's what your constituents want. Um, it, Congress is really a question of what do the constituents want and how can you get it to them? Um, and so this uh, process, you know, you, you think it's a very simple process uh, of what do they want, they've told me. And now I go do it. Um, but there's a lot of constituents. And so it really ends up looking more like this chart here, um, where essentially you have citizens, the, the constituents themselves, the voters, um, think tanks, uh, and there'll be different organizations. Perhaps the Arlington Planetarium would be an example of, a, of an organization that would uh, perhaps reach out to their congressional representatives. Um, and then the last would be the sort of scientists, advocates, what one might call lobbyists, um, basically the informed personnel who are experts on the issue but might have a little bit of a vested interest in, in what, the, uh, what happens. Um, all of these people reach out to their congressional representatives, but again, there's a lot of constituents and there's only one representative or two or three. Um, and, uh, and so really what ends up happening is you end up reaching out to staffers. Staffers are, um, well, you guys are in Arlington or many of you are, you probably know a few staffers or you might. Uh, and these are, these are professional individuals whose goal it is whose job it is, is to take in information about a lot of different topics, synthesize it together and package it up and hand it to their congressional representative in a, in a concise manner that the um, congressperson can then vote on, can then propose legislation on, can then do Congress things with. Um, because the government does a lot and there's way too much for any in individual to, to know everything about. So what that really looks like, um, I believe this is a photo of uh, a, um, a, a local office, uh, I'm gonna guess Texas. Um, and, uh, and that is um, what's going on here is, is very endemic of the system. And that is an empty chair where the congressperson is off in Washington, DC. Um, and then there is a staffer sitting at a desk with a phone and a notepad. And uh, I, if you don't think that your Congress people care about what you think, I promise you they do because if they didn't, they wouldn't have a bunch of staffers sitting around with notepads answering your phone calls. Um, now, sometimes politics gets a little heated and they get the staffers get overwhelmed, uh, but generally speaking, they, these people exist and they, and they want to hear what you have to say. Um, 
And that leads us to this sort of staffer secret. Uh, and that is, it shouldn't be a secret at all. Um, and that is that if, if, if an issue is not massively politically driven, um, if it's not all over the news and everyone's screaming at each other and posting on Facebook about it, um, and there's a lot of these things that aren't being yelled about, uh, going and talking to your congressperson has a huge impact on what they will do. Um, it is it is a it is a massive more so far more than visits from lobbyists. If you a voter or constituent go and talk to your congressperson, that will go a long way in informing how they end up deciding. So um, this is uh, you know I, I I've seen this in person. Um, the the best one was a uh, NASA hearing where a, a representative from Massachusetts. Um, stood up and said, I don't have anything to say to NASA, um, but to the FAA guy sitting right next to him, um, I've got a problem with your airport plan for my district and goes on and just tears this FAA representative a new one in a hearing about like drone security, um, tears this guy a new one because his constituents were mad about the way that planes were flying over his district. Your, your representative has no shame they will do whatever they need to, to make it you feel like they are representing your interests. And so this is their, this is their plan of action. And they, they simply wanna do whatever the constituents want. Now we'll get them reelected. And then there's the question of what do their constituents want? A lot of times on a lot of issues, they have not been told, They're, they don't know. Um, and so if their constituents haven't, uh, you know, haven't said what they want, um, they go to sort of this de facto thing that again, almost all congressional offices do, which is simply what will bring jobs. You might've heard, you know, jobs might be like this ridiculous buzzword in politics, but there's a reason for it. And that is that const you know, constituents, well, here's an equation for you. The one equation, no? One equation is unemployed constituents equals sad constituents equals, uh, unemployed Congress people. And that's real bad for them. So, you know, this is a very simple formula, anyone can get it. And so, uh, you know, they just want to get, um, they, they want to make sure that, uh, that we have um, happy constituents. Um, so NASA has, uh, the, the, the good news is that NASA is very good at this. NASA is very good at, at keeping constituents happy. Um, and we're going to talk about the tool that NASA uses to uh, explain this. Um, in a little bit, but essentially, you know, we've got a, a long history of doing what I'm going to call cool stuff. Um, and uh, two pictures of cool stuff can be seen here. Um, and the, in order to convince Congress that this cool stuff is worth doing, um, we have a specific tool. And this is going specifically out of my, out of my experience with the Legislative Affairs Office. Um, basically, our job was to use this tool and go talk to Congress people. Um, and this tool, you can see this map on the right. Uh, this is a screenshot from what's called the procurement map. Um, and uh, this procurement map is essentially, uh, I mean, again, it's the people's agency. And so whatever money NASA gets, NASA has to keep track of how we spend. And that is, uh, you know, we keep track of how we spend it in every state and in every district in every state. On this map, you can, if you follow this link, you can click on each state and then uh, see which district, you know, which, which districts are getting money um, from NASA, whether it's to, uh, you know, the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, getting millions of dollars a year, um, billions of dollars a year, um, to a lot of times though, it is as small as like, you know, we need aerospace grade nuts and bolts, and we're gonna go to a veteran owned, minority owned business in South Dakota and buy some aerospace grade nuts and bolts so that we can go to the South Dakota senators and congressmen, Congress people and say, look at all this money that we're sending into your district. Look at all these jobs you're creating. Wow, we support the veterans. And Congress people say, yes, yes, we do support the veterans. And then they fund NASA. Um, that, is, that is sort of one uh, tool that we use. Um, the next tool that we use is the, uh, is the, um, you know, we, we talk about the, uh, the sorry. Um, ah, perfect, somebody's posted in the chat. Excellent, thank you. Um, so the, uh, 
the, you know, the next tool that we use is, is we, we also like to talk about spinoffs a lot. And everyone's heard that Velcro was a NASA thing, but then everyone's heard that Velcro wasn't actually a NASA thing. Um, but uh, there are, you know, there are entire websites, binders, uh, albums, chock full of all sorts of different uh, spinoffs that NASA has created. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a few just from, you know, one of the tasks that I had to do was highlight spinoffs from Journey to Mars, uh, the Obama administration's Mars program. So uh, Mars spinoffs, um, a couple cool ones. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Uh, one of my favorites is, uh, I mean, obviously there's the cool one up the top uh, that is the panoramic cameras. Um, so whenever you take a panorama with your phone, uh, that same stitching technology that pulls together um, pulls together uh, uh, photos and puts them in a, in a panorama that was uh, in part developed by NASA. Um, the other great one, uh, you know, that people like is um, the uh, Kevlar and, and the sort of bulletproof vests for um, well for for safety officers. We have uh, um, you know NASA helped develop those uh, because we needed really tough fabrics to make really tough airbags. So that when we dropped a rover on another planet, uh, it would um, bounce safely uh, and then um, come upright. And so, making something that doesn't get punctured by Martian rock is is uh, somewhat akin to making something that doesn't get punctured by bullets. Um, not all research is, is applied. Uh, you know, not everything is it comes with spinoffs. Um, but then the last thing that everyone loves is, uh, or rather, especially uh, Congress people and their constituents, is um, high paying jobs, high tech jobs. Um, and universities are a great way to get high paying jobs and high tech jobs in a very educated populace. Um, but if you want universities, you need to have funding. Uh, and uh, tier one research universities, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but tier one research universities are actually, um, uh, I mean, my, my alma mater of University of Texas, half of its funding comes from federal research grants. Um, Tuition is, is, you know, getting college students to pay their tuition is nothing uh, or, or very, is smaller in, in comparison to the, uh, um, well, getting, getting uh, Uncle Sam to send you a couple billion to make nuclear submarines and something like that. Um, uh, and also, I mean, uh, blue sky science is, has, has long-term benefits and, uh, and a bit of national prestige that uh, Congress people generally like to uh, be able to tout to their constituents. So in summary, um, you know, uh, science has a way, we, we can obviously navigate uh, our, our, our scientific institutions through a government lens. Um, we can't exist in this bureaucracy. Um, and to, to summarize your, your uh, legislative branch lesson, um, you know, the next election is your representative's goal. They're not, you know, mustache twirling villains trying to stop, stuff their pockets full of money. Generally speaking, they, they are just trying to get reelected. And so if you can make that an easy equation for them, um, you know, if, you can, if you can let your congressperson know, look, you don't need to run expensive ads. You just need to vote for science. Um, that will go a long way. Um, so with that, I would encourage everyone to actually you know, be, be the advocates that we're talking about here and, uh, and you know, go to the halls of Congress that are looking very pretty in that photo. Um, and uh, and and you know let your let your representatives know let them know that you what you value and and why you value it. Um, and that is that is the end. Oh, I, I do actually have one more photo because science and the government um, from from the uh, '90s film Independence Day. I just I don't know. I felt like this was relevant for some reason. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, please, uh, any any other questions? What was the uh, formula that you warned us about, the one with, that started with uh, unemployed constituents? Yes, yes, okay. absolutely. There's no math involved. It's just equal signs. I was, I was so looking forward to it. Um, I hope it didn't let you down. It is, uh, um, it is tried and true. That is, that is certainly uh, for sure. And I can say from personal experience that our local representatives and their staffers are very friendly and not at all intimidating to deal with. That is, that is excellent to hear. You know, and, and again, like I'm over here talking about sort of like rosy ideals of, of democratic accessibility. Um, I, I will acknowledge that, you know, sometimes politics gets 
very messy. And um, sometimes your representatives are very busy because there are, you know, um, a, a million uh, underrepresented women um, who are very angry uh, and rightfully so marching on the Capitol and sending lots of emails and sending lots of phone calls. And you know, you you calling about a, a space telescope is probably not going to be high on their radar because they have other priorities and other things to deal with. But um, generally speaking, you know, when when there is not fire and brimstone in the Capitol, um, the uh, you know you you will find your representatives to be surprisingly um, surprisingly accessible. So I'm, I'm I'm glad you've you've experienced that as well. Um, all right, well, I will go ahead and sign off and uh, thank you again. And uh, everyone, I hope you have a great day.